every student that studies English literature has at some point asked themselves if the author truly intended for the themes that are in their book to be there. The same question occurred to me recently when watching a Pony Smasher video where David F. Sandberg said, well, let's see what he said. This exterior location is scheduled to shoot early on. And turns out we don't have Faith, who plays Darla because she's still on another show. She'll be available when we shoot the interior on a soundstage, but she won't be available here. Well, shit, okay. Let's say she was really slow with tying her shoes, so she never got outside in time. Of course, on the day you realize that her shoes are actually Velcro, so there's no tying laces, and I guess Darla is just really slow in general. Anyway, you did it. There's a reason why Darla is inside, and there's a reason why the kids are all sweating in their winter clothes when they're indoors. It's done. But working with movies has kind of ruined video essays and film analysis a little bit for me, because you just never know if something was part of a brilliant plan, or if it just happened to turn out that way because a problem had to be solved on the day. In Shazam, Darla has a clearly defined arc. Early on, we see her being the slowest of the foster kids, which is, of course, the setup to the payoff of her getting super speed powers later on. Yeah, 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 yes. For him, video essays and analysis have been ruined because there was a theme that occurred in his film by accident. So today I'm asking, does that really matter? Does an author of a piece of art need to understand their art for it to be valid? Oh, and spoilers, naturally. Let's take a sidestep away from Pony Smasher and Shazam and first take a look at a more straightforward example. Look at this scene from Ben Stiller's movie Zoolander. So why male models? Think about it, Derek. Male models were genetically constructed to become assassins. They're in peak physical condition. They can gain entry to the most secure places in the world. And most important of all, Models don't think for themselves. They do as they're told. That is not true. Yes, it is, Derek. OK. Yeah. Think about any photo shoot you've ever been on. You're a monkey, Derek. You're a monkey. Dance, monkey, in your little spangy shoes. Smash your symbol, Simpy. Dance, Derek, dance! Good point. But if this has been going on for so long, Mugatu... Well, he's just a punk-ass errand boy working for an international syndicate of fashion designers. You do a little background check on your Mr. Mugatu, you'll find that he sold his soul to the devil for a shot at the big time. But why male models? You serious? I just... I just told you that a moment ago. Right. Derek Zoolander and Matilda Jeffries are meeting with hand model J.P. Pruitt, who is explaining the central evil plot of the movie. So the joke here is clearly that Zoolander is so stupid that he doesn't understand the very simple explanation given to him, a discussion that he was an active part of. His reaction underpins the point that J.P. Pruitt was making. Male models are dumb and do what they are told. This is Excellent writing. Except it wasn't in the script. Ew. All right, forget it. No, no, no. no. Do, 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 be cool. Sorry, come on. I'm sorry, please go ahead. My mistake. Still, I forgot his next line and just repeated the last line that he remembered. And David Duchovny just ran with it. Does it matter that this joke was a result of serendipity? Does it make it less funny? I don't think so. The scene is funny, and after I found out about how it came to be, well, it's still funny. And whether the writer intended it or not, Zoolander's reaction does reinforce the point made by Pruitt. Intent, in this instance, changes nothing. And now for something completely different. The same applies for another comedy film, Monty Python and the Quest for the Holy Grail. Famously, they use coconuts instead of horses. But 
this wasn't the original intent. They wanted to use horses, but they just couldn't stretch the budget to include them. Whose idea was the whole coconut bit? Uh, Michael. Terry and I wanted to use real horses. We thought we were proper film directors. Yeah. yeah. So it was Michael Palin who suggested they use coconuts. Does that make it less funny? The knights are still running around the countryside with their seconds clapping coconuts together to make it seem like they're riding on horses. I don't think it's less funny, especially as they made so much out of it. Now we can sit and we can talk about the deconstruction of of Hollywood and filmmaking as a medium that presents not the truth, but a simulation of the truth all day long. But at the end of the day, they still made the decision that coconuts would just be funny because they can't afford horses. All of those points still hold true. So both of these examples, though, are not direct comparisons to what Sandberg was talking about. So let's go back to our original example, because I think it has elements of both. The actress playing Dala, we're told, wasn't available on the first day of shooting, so Sandberg adapted well and did something that is recognisable to parents everywhere. My youngest daughter has always been the slowest to put her shoes on. Every parent I know complains about the same thing. Dala is the youngest, and so it fits our real-world expectations of her character. We move on to the finale, and the critic says that Dala's arc pays off because she was the slowest earlier, and now she has super speed. Well, I think that kind of works, but I have some questions. Doesn't she also have the other powers that Shazam does? Can't she fly? Isn't she super strong? Aren't they all blessed with the powers of Shazam now? I don't know because the movie doesn't make it expressly clear and I've never read a Shazam comic in my life. Sure, Dala primarily shows super speed, but for me to state that this is a true arc that improves the film, I'd be looking at how the other characters demonstrate their powers. If they all paid off, then I'd praise the film for it. But even if I grant the critic that outlined this as punctuating Dala's arc, that this is what is happening, Sandberg tells us that the setup was a result of scheduling. Again, I don't think that would matter. The character arc is still there no matter how it comes about. At the end of the day, natural themes and growth make for more realistic and believable characters. That is why we learn about themes and structure. That's why channels like mine exist. Does every character have to have a defined arc? No, but the writing is better if they do, and your brain notices even if you don't. We identify character arcs as a way to show realistic characters reacting and acting in their world. The more believable and identifiable the characters and story are, the more we are able to have empathy for them and sympathise with their situation. In short, we spend less time thinking about if the film is flawed and more time in suspension of disbelief. The directors and writers who succeed in doing that are the ones that make films that live on long after their initial release. And I don't think the filmmaker's intent has any bearing on that. If we want to identify the writers and directors who give their characters better arcs so that we can look out for their films in future, then of course their level of intent in their art is very important. But apart from that, I don't think it matters at all. I'll still love their character, their film or even their dumb joke even if they didn't mean for it to be the way it ended up. If the character has an arc, the movie is better for it. And if we isolate our experience to this one film, then that's all that matters. Thanks for watching our video. Let me know in the comments, do you agree? Is it important whether an artist knows why their art is good? And don't forget to like, share and subscribe. I'm Piers from Popcorn Dreams, and I'll see you next time.